this time we've got Trek Factory Racing's newest member, Bori Kuhn. He's an absolute madman. I was so surprised. I don't know why I was surprised at how rapid he was at the team camp, shooting the team camp video for Trek. He's just absolutely pinned and so keen. He's a bit of a thoroughbred athlete. So it was really interesting to hear about his background and where he's came from and what that environment and the community was like around him and how keen they were for action sports. And you can see it because he's so sick on even skis, like hucks double flips on skis and then comes and absolutely shreds at the World Cups downhill. So an incredible athlete and a really cool conversation. We even talked about aliens. Oh man. So yeah, enjoy. Well, well, yeah, like my dad and I used to like, he filmed me a lot when I was like a kid. Yeah. Like before I, he was like, I'm already a nobody, but before I was even more of a nobody, then yeah, I did that. But like just on like a little Sony, what is it? What are they? Like ASIC? That cam. Yeah. <laughs> that cams are sick, man. Dude, got, so wait, I, got, go. I, got a, I got a new one this year, like um, one of the newer Sony ones. And it's actually like, it's one of the larger ones and it's, it's good for everything. Like it, I mean, I gave the camera to Celia today and she just knew how to use it straight away and like, and just gets like, well, you put your hand on it and then the record button's right there. So it's like, oh, you hit it once and you're like, oh yeah, no, we chilling. Yeah. yeah. It's also like really disarming as well. Like when you put a, a dad cam in front of somebody and like speak to them, they're, they're normally really like, just like silly and stupid. Yeah. Whereas like, if you point like that, <laughs> yeah, that, true. they're like I don't know. It's just I feel different. like every time I even when I see that one, I feel like I act like a bit of a knob, but like in a good way. I don't know. You're gonna get a lot more used to it this year. It'll be good. Ah. By the end of the year, you'll be a, like a natural. You'll just it'll just be natural. Yeah, maybe, maybe. You seem pretty good at it anyway. You're actually quite. You seem quite mature. Thank you. Um, for I your act, age. Well, I act less mature when I'm around fucking Kate and these guys. <laughs> but yeah, we're probably yeah. Like everyone around here is not very mature, but. No, really no, nobody that. can see it <laughs> <laughs> yeah no thank you i appreciate it do you, why do you think that is <sighs> i don't know i feel like probably just the way i grew up like my parents were quite independent like not so like not helicopter parents at all so i had a lot more space and the people i grew up with you know like they were in a similar situation they were allowed to make their own decisions and yeah i don't know i feel like that made a big difference so you were kind of like free to do whatever you wanted. Yeah. Like the, my parents were there and they like, they guided me and they supported me when I needed to, but it was never like, this is what we're doing. This is what you have to do. This is like, you're racing today or you're racing tomorrow, or you have to go do this in school and like achieve this. They let me figure out what I wanted to do on my own. And through that, I think I was able to start making decisions on my own earlier than a lot of people are. And I think that probably helped. I don't know. Yeah, I was wondering because it's some kids, I guess, like they have to fight to get out of whatever the original plan was. So like I'm kind of the same as you. My parents were like, whatever you want to do, yeah. you can just kind of go and do it. So were they racers themselves? Is that right? My dad was a racer. He raced like for quite a while. He used to race downhill like the Canadian National Series and then raced Enduro for a few years before... He's finally started getting to the age where he's like, okay, I don't need to write myself off every weekend and he can just coach me and my sister. And my mom never really got into it because it just wasn't her thing. She was more into like the XC side of stuff. Not XC, she'd be mad if I said that. The enduro side of stuff. But she never really was that keen on racing downhill. My sister was though. Yeah. And was, it, was there ever like even a thought of getting like a, like a normal like job or career path or anything well, like that? <laughs> For me, like growing up in Roslyn, you, if you don't ski and you bike, I don't know what else you really do. Mm. So in in the community I grew up in, and it was kind of it, like, it seemed like that was the normal job, right? Like a lot of my friends growing up and a lot of my sister's friends are professional athletes now. And for me, ever since I started racing, and I, I that was always my goal. I, like more than a goal, I was always just, that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I was gonna do. So mm. for me, it was never, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit different. So it's never been, you've never thought about kind of doing anything else. It's always just been like. Well, there's there's things I'm, I want to do after biking, like 
things that you know like r rocket engineering and i cars and surfing and um, lots of other stuff but i knew at some point in my life i was always going to be a professional mountain biker one way or another wow yeah. that's really cool like it sounds a bit weird saying that like a bit cocky but in my mind it was more just like it wasn't like my decision that yeah, i was, was going to be that yeah it was just that was going to happen right and it would have been weird for me if it didn't mm. not because of like my ability or any of that stuff or how well i did just because that's how i grew up with those kind of people around me mm. yeah and when did you realize that like okay like i'm actually quite good at this <sighs> that's a tough one i don't really know i feel like my first year racing when i like i won the first three races and that like I was kind of surprised by that. I mean, I like I had hoped so much. That's like I'd been excited for years to go and do it. But at the same time, it was kind of like, who knows? You know, like there's a lot of fast kids out there, especially like when I was growing up, it was Jackson was there, Tegan, a lot like a lot of other guys. Right. So it was kind of surprising. And then ever since then, it just was like, oh, OK, well, if I'm this good now, how good can I be in a year? And then, in, you know, how many how far can that take me? So you're still at school. At the moment, is that right? Uh, I finished my all of my in-person stuff um, in December. Yeah, the end of December. So I have like one half of a course left online. So a lot more time now. Sick. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, your first year junior, I guess, would be a good place to to start. How did how did that go? What was your setup like? It went like, I feel like it went pretty well. There was, I feel like there was quite a few opportunities that I might not so much that I missed, but that I could have capitalized on. But overall, I mean, it was exactly what I planned and what, you know, people around me expected of me is just, you know, a slow build into the season, work my way into it, just ride at a pace where I'm not going to get injured. I'm not going to make too many mistakes. And yeah, I, I slowly built to that. There was a point towards the end of the year where I was getting a little frustrated because I had some issues like in race runs and stuff like that where I really thought I was in a position where I could do better than I had yet that year and then just small little things that you know crashes or little stuff like that so there was a little bit at the end of the year it felt like there's a little bit left to be desired but I mean if there wasn't probably in the wrong sport so yeah yeah did did, did the world cup try it's like when you first got to them, did they surprise you at all? Like, were you like, oh shit, this is crazy? Or were you like, actually, this is actually okay? It was kind of like, oh shit, this is crazy because they're a lot easier than I thought they were going to be. Because mm. a lot of people who would race World Cups had told me like, oh, it's it's so gnarly. It's like nothing you've ever ridden. And it is, but it's it's not that much gnarlier, right? Like the, the, the hard parts and the scary parts are the speed that you ride it and just trying to understand that people can ride it at this insane pace. It's not so much the actual tracks that are hard besides like Val de Soleil and a couple other ones, but yeah. How were your times in junior comparing to like elite last year? There was, yeah, a couple of races I was pretty, you know, competitive. I think I had like two top 10 elite times, which I personally don't think really were, you know, that accurate because you know tracks change a lot between morning and afternoon when the least race so it's hard to say but i think i was putting a pace down that i was very like if i was first year elite i wouldn't have been mad about like i would have been okay this is a good sp sp stock sp spot to start building on but yeah hopefully this year we can get on a little higher it must have been was it a bit weird because like the the setup with with Trek, you were kind of like almost thrust in there because of Charlie yeah. kind of heading out. So you're kind of subbed in, but you're not really, you you wouldn't have really felt like you were fully on the team. Was that like a weird sort of? Yeah, well, it was, it was kind of weird because it was like Charlie got hurt at Fort William. So there was like a couple of weeks at this, like during that, because it was a small injury that it was like, okay, you know, supports there. And then it was kind of weird because he, he was going to come back to racing and then it was going to, I would have been back on my own or like, a, like less support because there would have been one less mechanic, but he got hurt again. 
and he was out for the rest of the season. And then at that point, my results were, they were getting quite a bit better and there was space on it. So, you know, by closer to like Mossadan and then like world championships, it was pretty, it wasn't that much different than it is now. Like they were, I was eating dinners with the team. They were working like on the bikes with me. They were, we were on the track, you know, all the stuff that we're doing now, just, you know, it's still like, it was more of like a, not like an ego thing, but like, like it still felt like, okay, you know, not really on the team. Like I'm not like one of the guys we don't, you know, we don't go to the team camps and stuff together. So that like now having that this year, like even when we showed up to the first team camp and we're all in the matching kits, it was like, okay, this is, this is pretty cool that I'm here with all of my heroes, but I'm part of it. Right. I'm part of the team. It was, it was a cool thing. Is it, is it kind of like, relieving in, t- in terms of like any pressure that you've got on yourself or is it more added more because you're like okay i need to perform i no i don't think it's for me at least so far it, it hasn't been like that at all like the only added pressure is because i really i just want to do well for myself i know that i have the ability to you know show a lot of people what i can do but as far as like i feel like the team has put very little pressure on me they're trying to do everything they can to help me get to the place where i want to be and that makes a big difference like there's not like you need to do this this and this or whatever it's just we're going to give you the tools that you need to go do what you believe you can do so that's that's how I feel. Yeah. Did you think it would be more like a little bit more regimented than it is? Like and a little bit more like sort of rigorous? Because it is, there, there's plenty of like, f- it's a great vibe on the Trek team. It's no. just like a bit, there's loads of freedom and fluidity in, in yeah, the team. Yeah, for sure. I feel like maybe not so much this year because I experienced it last year, but coming into last year, like having really not much idea what the team was getting, like what World Cup teams were like at all. I'd never been around one. I thought it would be a bit more like strict, like a bit more like a lot of, there's a lot of people and a lot of time and money going into us four athletes racing like on the weekend, right? So I thought there was gonna be a lot of external pressure coming in and a lot of people just telling you what you need to do and not really giving you any leeway in that. But like they they understand that as an athlete, because there's a lot of athletes on the team that work like to support us, they understand that you're not gonna perform to your best abilities when you're in that kind of stressful environment. Yeah, like Andrew and that, they've been, they've been there themselves, you know, they know. Yeah, for sure. Um, what do you think about, I don't know, just the team in general, like how you how you feeling on? I'm, I'm stoked, I'm excited. Yeah. I like- It seems like a really good fit for you specifically. Yeah, you know? I, it's just like, I love being on my bike. I love being on my bike with friends and like, Every, like Cade, Reese and Loris, they're all like some of my best friends and we go ride and we have a great time. And it's so nice to have people that you can build off that are the fastest, best bikers in the world, right? And it's an extremely useful tool and they just happen to be really nice guys at the same time. Mm. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's a really good fit, I think. Equally, it's like there is a bit of back and forth there in that sometimes for riders, they're just hanging about with riders their own age, like getting somebody younger on is like really sick. Cause mm. is that like youthful energy? Like I you're think, stoked, yeah. you know, like that day filming that we just had, like you're just absolutely having <laughs> it down the trails. Like you're going flat out. And sometimes that's what, what is required to like lift the rest of the group up as well. So yeah, for sure. I mean, Cade was saying the same thing. He's like, oh man, like back, he's like a couple of years ago, I was the same way, just keen. And he's like, you're getting me stoked. Like every time we go out and you know, good energy builds more good energy. And I think like, I don't want to speak for them, but I think overall it's a positive thing. Yeah, definitely is. Yeah. It's going to be good as well. Like just, I guess you've not really done any sort of like <laughs> filming or any sort of that stuff that like you're gonna get you're getting the full package this year you know, I know. It's, like, it's, a, it's a good time to join the team yeah a lot it's, of exciting stuff happening yeah. yeah yeah it's gonna be good what do you think about the kind of new setup with the new rules and all that sort of stuff you're in a quite a good position i guess because you're not being upset by it yeah because you've not done that much work yeah, exactly. racing anyway so i don't know how do you feel about it i feel like yeah like you said i'm in a great position i think the fact that we're gonna be there we're gonna be covered 
in the live stream, however that works out, I think up my ups my value as a rider a lot. And I think like Trek and I think a lot of other people like that's a positive thing for them. I think the now seeing the schedule, I think it's a little strange. I feel like the I don't know, we'll have to work out track walk practice same day, how much practice we're going to have. Like we're racing the same course at very similar speeds now. It's like hopefully we don't have reduced practice because then, you know, then it increase for risk and that like it might get a little dicey. But I'm I'm hopeful that it, it'll be the best like they'll make it. They want to make it the best they can to provide the best show and safest options for the riders. So fingers crossed that it all works out. I mean, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. That's it. Like at this point, it's all yeah. just speculation and it. it's like like that's quite a that's quite a balanced take on it. I think, you know, just wait and see. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like you can, there's, there's, there can be a lot of positives to it. Like hopefully, you know, if you think about this long term, it should help to grow the sport in a really big way if the, if it's done right. So as long as it is done right, I think it will end up being a really positive thing. I think there's a lot of criticism, you know, people are scared of change the way that Red Bull doing it was doing it was like, it wasn't wrong in any way. It was just different. So I feel like for a lot of people, it's they're solving problems that they don't see being an issue as it is right now. But who know, like you know, to reach a more mainstream audience, maybe that's stuff that has to get done. Yeah, it's it's going to be exciting to see long term, like the ten year. You know, like they have it for eight years. So yeah. I mean, they might have it beyond that, but. Like Eight over years. that course of time, like what's going to come out of that, you know, like yeah. it's going to be very interesting. It's a, it's a journey either way. And the way that I see it, like you can't kill how good the sport is. Like it's yeah. impossible to ruin the sport because it's, it's just that spectacular and that, yeah. that great of a spectacle. So it's yeah, always sure. going to be that rad regardless. Yeah. So this is the first year that juniors are on the yeah. live stream since God knows when. Yeah. That's exciting. I just didn't. I just yeah, no, to for sure. That. I mean, it's like it's weird because you know, all year last year, it's everybody from my small hometown and all my friends and family. They're like, you know, how do we watch you? And it's always just been like, ah, oh, you can't. But now they can. Like, who knows exactly how how it'll be covered? I can't really see it. Like, I can't imagine it being the same as like elite coverage is because you know that's a lot of racing and when you it's even if we're riding at similar speeds like people aren't going to watch f2 as much as they watch f1 it's just it's hard to bring in that audience but hopefully there's enough draw where people get excited about it it's it's more just the fact that it's getting recorded at all mm. is exciting because like you'd miss you'd miss stuff like unless you're wearing a gopro yeah i mean just just from my perspective like the junior racing is mostly missed yeah. like oh it's almost completely missed it's yeah, almost like, completely missed it's a couple vital raws weekend recaps and then the results that are posted on vital or pink bike like that's what junior racing has been mm. so either way there's a thousand percent more coverage than there already was so i mean it's not going to be a bad thing yeah it's almost like the core people that are really into it are going to watch like everything yeah. that comes out so that'll be multiple days of coverage yeah for i'd sure. imagine so yeah your diehards are always going to tune in and yeah you'll sure. get to see the new up-and-coming juniors like yourself and i hope it works out kind of like 250 class does in supercross where yeah, yeah it's not the premier 450a class but there's it's just as exciting racing people want to watch it just as much as they do the 450s right i yeah. hope it's a similar thing but we'll see are you a big motocross fan oh yeah big time yeah. How can you not be? How can you not be? I don't know of any World Cup racers that wouldn't rather be racing Supercross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy that like the inspiration, even just from a style point of view, like yeah. when you see people being stylish on a mountain bike, they're trying to mimic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Yeah. Motocross. It's yeah. Funny. No, that's a cool thing. You ride a bit of motocross as well? Yeah. As much as I can. I ride trails a lot just because that's kind of what we have where I live. But if if i had a track closer that was you know a sick track i'd probably be on that a lot but i'm moving to the island soon the vancouver island so hopefully mm. i heard there's a lot of really good tracks there mm. there's also just a buttload of really good mountain biking there so yeah, i think you'll be quite uh, distracted by that yeah you exactly know? lots um, of stuff to do skiing though like 
how much skiing have you done in your life just as much as i have mountain biking i guess right. like every year since i was two years old and yeah two I mean, years old yeah yeah it's been a long time and i mean it's still like up until only a few years ago it was like which way do i want to go do i want to be a biker or do i want to be a skier and it's it's a very small niche industry to get in like being a professional skier like it's really hard to do it like some of the best skiers in the world are just they're scraping by so it's just the and overall it was just it wasn't like ski brands and those companies they're awesome but it's not quite the same level of support and same atmosphere that you can't that you get at like bike races and just biking in general maybe that's because the like there's less product yeah so you got jackets skis boots yeah for sure goggles yeah. helmet but then look at all the bicycle parts that you have it's like yeah for sure it's probably and it's like ski racing's like it's huge right it's a massive sport but you know like free ride skiing is it's cool but not that many people know about it like it's still a small thing and it's 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 a weird thing to get into i think for a lot of people and it's there's like there's so much to understand and there's so much to do that i think a lot of people are just like i'll leave it where it is and you know i don't think it's as it is right now reaching the same amount of people mm. that it could be yeah maybe it's, it depends which type of skiing you're watching mm. like i don't know the numbers on like uh downhill skiing like I, yeah i'm sure that's pretty well well watched yeah um did you ever you said free ride there did you ever consider going that that when when was it like okay i'm a i'm a racer you know this yeah like only maybe three four years ago probably kind of thing right because it was like i still ski like every day when i'm at home like i i can't bike so that's just what i do but it was i mean it was a really hard decision and it was never like i was never like okay that's it i'm done with skiing i'm gonna be a mountain biker but the way it, it worked out it was like okay it just you know started riding for track and then started racing world cup and started doing well and it's just it all made sense to move towards that instead of trying to do something else and are your parents like both they're both into both yeah oh yeah big time is it more mom or dad nah they're they're both they're both in it yeah. yeah yeah like they go ski to run almost every day together or so, every day that they can yeah you're like a you're like a thoroughbred yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it's in the blood you know yeah um what do they do like how have they gotten into this situation where they can yeah you know, well a long long story of weird events that led my dad to being a health emergency manager in british columbia which you know he went to school he got his degree in english he never expected to have that happen but i get like some issues with i think it was like my mom or like my mom getting into America coming from Canada. She wasn't able to like get her visa or whatever. And so my dad was planning on going to Colorado, I think, to get his master's degree. Not quite sure. But he ended up, they ended up being like, okay, we're not going to do that. And then they were like, what do we do? And they were going to go to China to teach English. And then at the last minute, they're like, wait, we really don't want to go to China to teach English. So they were like, okay, let's, I don't know how they decided, but they moved to Bella Coola, British Columbia. So like a really, really small remote town, north, southern north coast of British Columbia, and just started living there, started skiing. I mean, they had already both been skiers their whole life and bikers, but they kind of got into that. And then a bunch of other stuff happened. They moved to Kamloops. They hated it there because it's like a weird, big, gross city kind of thing. It's not big, but like it's not the nicest place. And then they're like, okay, let's move to Roslyn. And then when they moved to Roslyn at that point, they were super into biking and skiing and that lifestyle. And then they just continued to do it for, I guess. Yeah, I've, I've been living there ever since I was one year old. So the last 17 years. Yeah. What a place to live. Have you? <laughs> yeah. It sounds, it sounds like they're quite... um. They've been on a bit of like an education path as well. So like you say that you were you were kind of left to decide your own fate, mm. which is I think how it should be for everyone. Yeah. Um, but was there, there must have been some sort of like discipline element. Yeah, there. for sure. I mean, like as much as 
I said, like I say, they don't, they didn't have like set expectations for me. They still had like, they wanted me to do well in school. Like they wanted me maybe not to, like they didn't care so much about the marks and the grades that I was having, but as long as I was applying myself to the fullest and I have like, I, I, I was good at school like throughout my life. So yeah, I mean, they pushed me to just achieve what I could, like the most that I could. And that happened to work out in the ways it did. Are you like a big training guy? Do you like, you like going to the gym? Are you, or are you just doing that much skiing and riding that you're just kind of fit? I mean, I like going to the gym. I, it's been like the last few years, it's been like, it's been like training in the gym, but not so focused this year. It's been quite a bit more focused, but still like, you know, hit the gym, like go to the gym four times a week, whatever, three, four times a week, and then skiing and biking and doing everything else I can like the rest of the time just to, you know, like still have fun on the bike, still ride motos, still do all that stuff. Like if you practice going full pin on a four minute downhill track, you'll probably be better suited to go full pin on a four minute downhill track at a world cup than, you know, hitting the gym eight times a week kind of thing. Like it builds, it's the only way to train for mountain biking is mountain biking. Totally. I don't think enough people do full runs yeah at when they're just i don't do a full run I don't do <laughs> yeah yeah well that's it like you yeah. know um yeah it's definitely danny hart's the man for that he mm. just does tons of full runs throughout yeah. practice yeah i think that's brilliant because then you know the pacing of when you're not for sure you know that you're going to be tired so that bump at the bomb like you might need to f- yeah. go around that or whatever. no i agree i think i think it's something that i need to work on coming into this year it's like it's so easy on the world cup tracks that are so demanding and so long to just get like you're tired and you're like oh okay conserve energy you know like i want to ride the next section well but it's like if you don't practice when you're tired you come to it on your race run and you're totally gassed and you're gonna make mistakes and it's hard to be as precise as you want to be totally i think it will ultimately require feels like to me it'll require a little bit more fitness with the semi-final and the yeah and the final um, like of course you're doing your practice runs in the morning but it's not the same as that intensity of that you know and these people will be fighting for a spot of that yeah of that final in the top 30 so i feel like it's gonna yeah people are gonna actually have to up yeah. their their fitness but as a verbal fans of motocross like you yeah. see you watch those guys do outdoors and they're like oh, that's ridiculous yeah 30 minutes plus two twice yeah, yeah. And, crazy I, like, I think it's really going to reward like really smooth riders, like people like Loris, right? That are just, just so smooth. Bikes don't make noise, just like really controlled, doesn't make very many mistakes. I think that like being able to do that on one run will make it a lot easier to do two full runs at full pace. Mm. Like if you're one of the riders who, you know, typically makes more mistakes, rides a little harsher, like quite rough on the bike, you're already you have a higher chance of making mistakes in your race run. But if you have to do that twice in a day, there's there's a lot of chances for you to mess up. 30 seconds to talk about our first ever sponsor, HIT. HIT is a smart device that attaches to an athlete's helmet to measure G-force during impacts and rotational force, which can give you an early indication of a potential concussion instead of relying on often unreliable gut feeling. Having real data helps you make informed decisions that are best for your long-term health and as a result, your performance. Crashing is not a fun topic, but pushing that limit is why we love this sport. HIT is a part of the evolution of action sports. We have to move away from arbitrary tests that don't work and put athletes at risk into a world where accurate data is embraced and used to protect our priceless brains. For more information, visit hitrecognition.co.uk. Now back to the podcast. We were talking about the dynamic between the new semi-final final on race day. I think a lot of riders were upset because it's almost like the fundamental nature of the sport before was that like everything into one run, yeah. sort of like everything gets let go. And like, I think that's a part of part of it that some riders think that it will be missing when you do it twice. Yeah. Just that like compression. But I think for a lot... For a lot of the riders, I think it's going to look like 90% speed on the semis and yeah. then 100 in finals. Yeah. But I don't know. Like people yeah, might just I be mean, going all out, but like the points I think have been reduced yeah. now for the, 
for the semis, but yeah. Which is, yeah. I mean, as long as they make the semi points low enough where it's not similar to the finals, then I think, yeah, you're right. Like that, they'll probably take it a lot easier, but so yeah, like you were saying, like coming up all the time until this year, it's been like the one run, this is the run, that's, that's how you get it done. But if you look at a lot of other sports, like, F1, motocross, uh, slope style mountain bikes, right? They have more than one runs. They're doing multiple laps on the same track. They're doing multiple motos, qualifying sessions, stuff like that. Like as much as it would be nice to have one run that decides it all, it's not uncommon. And it's like, it makes a lot of sense, you know? Like if you're gonna have one race, maybe somebody who's quite inconsistent but can go really fast might win the race but if you have 15 races maybe they'll win one and come 30 in the rest of them right because mm. they just make that many mistakes and i think it it'll show who's who are the best riders in the world because i think you know the more chances are to make mistakes the people who make less mistakes are going to go faster <laughs> yeah it's just simple at the end of the day yeah it is yeah um do you think who, who do you think are the kind of players in in junior because there's almost like an opportunity here yeah. for a consistent junior. Yeah, for to, you know, sure. Exactly what you just said, because juniors are the ones that are prone to, you know, inexperienced <laughs> bre breeds, you know, yeah, yeah. a bit of like uh, um, over enthusiasm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's like crashes, crashes happen in the junior yeah, category. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think there's like, there's a lot of people that are gonna be able to like fill in that position. I think there's a lot, like there's room for it. Like, I'm not gonna specifically name names because I'll know I'll forget some afterwards and then be like, oh, okay, that person. But like a lot of people from last year, like the fast first years, I think they have a good shot at like, you know, doing well, but there's always gonna be first years coming in that are gonna be able to ride fast and ride well. Like we've only had one year World Cup racing experience and they've had zero, right? So it's it's a definitely an advantage to have a, the year's experience, but it's still like it's possible to be really fast as a first year. So I don't think you can really count anybody out. I think there's, you know, we're like, we're so young in our careers and things you can improve so fast from one year to the next that I think there's going to be a lot of surprises. Yeah, people are, it seems like riders are getting better quicker. Yeah. From like a younger age. Yeah. And I've got this kind of like, kind of a theory that it's because of the amount of information that you can receive mm. from the internet and stuff yeah, like that sure. and just the amount of visual information that has been absorbed yeah. from such a young age like technique wise where like it's half of it will be subconscious but even listening to interviews mm -hmm. of writers yeah like there wasn't all that you'd have to troll through magazines or yeah or stuff like that when the sport was young and the same for motocross whereas all these you see these kids now on 65s and 85s and yeah. they're just ridiculous yeah. and i feel like that's happening in mountain biking as well and you're kind For of part sure. of that how much do you think you've learned from like watching videos yeah i mean it, it, like a lot of people they're always like if you want to get faster ride with faster people and what do you do when you ride with faster people you watch what they do you understand their lines it's the same thing on video right it, maybe you don't get the same like wow they're going so fast that you do in real life but understanding that they're riding at the speed that they are with the technique that they do you're like okay that's how you have to do it there's no maybe i try this maybe i try that like there's one way to do it properly and you can go online you can you have all the resources in the world to see it for free anytime you want so it, it i think it, it makes a big difference and like I feel like in mountain biking, there's like the highest level. I think that's just the level. I don't think you're like, I don't think ever there's going to be people that are coming in in elites that are just going to be up here. Like, I don't think you can do that anymore. I think there's not much more room for overall speed to get higher. But I feel like, yeah, like people nowadays, they're going like this, right? It's quick. It's fast. They're just getting up to that level a lot faster than maybe before, because I, I think that also has part to do with the level kept on growing at least it seems until like the last couple of years and then I, mean, I don't know maybe 2019 onwards the pace seems like it's been very similar it's just been really really fast mm. hard to do every weekend mm. yeah speaking of videos what has been I would normally start the podcast and ask people 
what's the greatest mountain bike film of all time? So what's what's your favorite mountain bike film? Oh, I love Rome. That's a oh, sick yeah. one. Yeah, there's a lot of good songs and good bikes and some funny stuff in there. Um, I really liked Gamble when that came out because yeah. that was just like, let's grab the sickest people in the world and just make a bike film with just a lot of biking in it, not a lot of messing around kind of stuff. So I thought that was a good one too. From like a story, a story one, what, what can you think of in terms of like a story that you've... Like my favorite, like... Yeah, like, I mean, Gamble's not like a, Gamble's oh, like a yeah. concept, yeah, but yeah. more of a shred it yeah. sort of thing with like a cool concept attached to it, but like more of like a documentary thing. It doesn't have to be within mountain biking either. Oh, well, I'd say within mountain biking, I really like the Flying Scotsman. Because like, <laughs> my, my. It was, I mean, you, like, obviously it was really well done and it's it was Reese Wilson, right? Like you watch him on a bike and you're just like, whoa, all the time. So I really like that one. Oh, I'm stoked to hear you say yeah. that. That's, no, I really like cool. that when that came out. I was like, wow, this is this is really good. Yeah. I feel like with your uh, the music that you showed me, you would have liked the tunes on that as yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, yeah. I, have you watched like Steve Pete Won't Back Down or any of that sort of stuff? I'm sure I have, but like off the top of my head, I feel like I don't watch as much like bike films anymore. Yeah. Like there's it's just like a lot of, I know it's like kind of weird because it's like, it's like fast, not like incredible quality, just YouTube videos kind of stuff. But yeah, they're out there. You, if you want to see a specific thing, it's going to like that very specific thing is I'm sure it'll be there for you. So I feel like I haven't really watched many films in a mm. while. No, totally. Like YouTube's the, the kind of the place to be. Yeah. But like the Flying Scotsman was interesting because we were like, are people even want, do people even want large films? Mm. Like we were kind of like, are people even bothered anymore? Like, do they yeah. care? But they do, so yeah. that's that's cool. I think there is a there is a thirst to 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 sit down for a long length of time and yeah. watch something that's like really compressed and yeah, and, sure. and well thought about. But yeah, yeah, and you like it's rare that you get, you know, how it was forty five minutes almost forty three fifty yeah fifty yeah. It's not that often that you get almost an hour just listening to somebody like Reese Wilson just talk about a season, the ups and downs. Right? It's it's real. It's not just like oh, everything's great. This race was awesome. This is great. Feeling good all the time. Like, no, the professional athletes struggle just as much as anybody else does. Like, yeah. it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, that's why the kind of, t you know, the team edit hmm. concept, just it just died. Yeah. Um, Steel City did a fantastic job with like, this is PE. Hmm. And then they did the syndicate. Yeah. Um, and that was sick. And then everybody tried to mimic that, hmm. but there wasn't the same chemistry and they were just hiring filmers in they yeah. were just making these like team roundup edits mm. and you remember they were they were posting them i don't know if you ever paid attention but like they would post every team video on pink bike mm. like after the weekend just all of them in a row all of them in a row and it'd be like you know polygon you know kona yeah. like all of them and they were all the same video the exact same exactly thing. the same yeah. and then like a month later you'd go and check and the, all the views would be a thousand yeah. thousand views like no literally yeah, nobody just the cares. same thousand people that are like actually want to watch yeah the exact like the same video obsessive people but yeah. it's not reaching like outwards yeah so we were always like right okay we we can't just like that that formula just doesn't work like no. it has to contain something that people can grab onto and relate to like yeah. character wise yeah i mean like a lot of people probably don't want to see like a biased team edit right they're gonna show the best of the weekend the best of their riders there's gonna probably be a lot of excuses and reasons why everything didn't go perfectly. People don't really wanna see that. They wanna see it from an outside perspective being like, no, this is what actually happened. It, yeah. it was nothing goes that smooth. Yeah, even from like, uh, so, I mean, bike brands, you know how it goes, bike brands pay to make films. Yeah. So like, if a bike snaps, exactly, you're not gonna be allowed to show that yeah. for 90% of the time, because where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. Okay, if the world already knows that the bike snaps, you might be able to put it in, but like little things like that that were important for the athlete, like, oh, I, I had a puncture mm. at this point, you can't, like, you might not be able to, to talk about that. Yeah. So, no, for sure. The, the sickest brands kind of like let you do that anyway, because it's like so important for the story. But yeah, that's, that's definitely a thing. Yeah, for sure. I like specific, like in the Flying Scotsman, when Reese went, like, when he said he fell off that bridge and he, like, that was a huge crash, right? Yeah. Like, 
I would never have known about that. Like nobody would have ever known about that, right? But it, it had such a big effect on the rest of the year. Like it's super cool to understand what happens when it's not, you know, their three minute race run on live like TV. And what's fucked about it is there's one of those stories happening with every single person. Yeah. Like that's kind of, it like upsets me that the amount of stories that are going on that are just not being yeah not being told like they might put it on a caption on instagram yeah so it doesn't do it near enough justice you no. know yeah that's because there's, there's so much exciting stuff in mountain biking like Isn't it? everybody has something that you don't know about going on and something you know that there's a reason why everything happens and it often it, yeah it doesn't get shown it's just like okay what oh this person didn't do as well as they should have this weekend yeah yeah uh, I was gonna go back to rockets and stuff because I, li- I like I like rockets. What yeah. do you think about? <laughs> what do you think about? Um, I don't know, like SpaceX, like Elon Musk's efforts and I mean, like that. as much as people love to hate him, right? Yeah, I mean, Every- he's, just, he's so big now, and it's oh yeah, Any- so powerful. And <laughs> anybody with that much money who does whatever they want, like he does, people yeah. aren't gonna like. Sure, he's probably not a great guy. He's not like his personality, what like the whole Twitter thing, all of that. That's not like, I don't, I don't care about that. You know, it's just not something I'm not interested in as a part of SpaceX and a part of somebody of the, you know, like space exploration community. Great. Right. Somebody with a ton of money who's willing to do really cool stuff whenever he wants. To me, that's awesome. Right. We, he gets as much as he, d- he wants done and everybody benefits from it is you know everybody's like oh you know let's put the money back here on earth it's like it's it's not that simple like so much of what we use today on earth is out in space floating around our planet like it's it's not that simple yeah we use starlink like the internet yeah as, for this brought like well not here we don't have it yeah, here yeah, but yeah. we will for the world cups yeah. yeah so it's like super high speed internet and you're like it works yeah it so it's like works. fair play you know like the the Elon himself, like, he's stretched the truth a bunch of times. Yeah, of he's course. like a salesman, mm-hmm. you know, so it, he's, he's lied a bunch of times about Tesla products and things yeah. like that. But as, it, yeah, I agree with you. It's like anyone that's got that ambition yeah. and like enables stuff like that to happen. It's just, yeah. just well, so and good. It's just like every business person's going to say the same thing. You just, you hear about what he's saying, right? Like none of these guys are like... They're trying to accomplish something. There's something that they want to get done. They're going to get it done. It's not always going to be exactly how you want it when you see it on a breaking news, whatever headline. It's, it's not going to be that way. And I mean, don't expect it to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully they can get make progress with the moon and stuff like that as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. Well, I mean, they should have their launch license soon for Starship. They did. It's their- funny how they need like a light. They need a license at all. Yeah. Like that you're talking about absolute <laughs> mental stuff, and yeah. they like who's giving them the license? <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> it's know ridiculous. I mean? But I mean, they're close. Like they did their, they well, their 33 static fire test, but three, two of the engines weren't working. But I mean, that's a, it's insane. Like it's already done the full wet dress rehearsal. Like it's it's almost ready to go which is it's gonna happen soon which is really cool whether you like him and you like the company or not yeah what what so what is that because i know about that rocket but what what's what is that yeah well starship and the super heavy booster they're you know they're spacex's plan to get to the moon and get to mars that's it's the gonna be the highest uh payload to orbit ever it's a massive rocket it's gonna be I mean, he has huge ambitions with it, trying to make, you know, just travel on the earth with, with spaceships, right? Seems mm-hmm. ridiculous, but yeah, I mean, there's rockets is like, n- like nothing we've ever seen, landing in ways we've never seen, doing stuff in orbit we've never seen, and it's all happening right now, and it's gonna be happening in the future in front of us in our lifetime. So to me, I'm like, that's, it's crazy, it's so cool. It's, we're gonna be at the time when we go from earth to another planet and to the moon again. And I don't know, to me that's, I'm like, why does everybody not find that really, really cool? Yeah, but, I think mo- I think most people do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people just can't see past the whole Elon thing, but 
Yeah, I think for sure. if he does it, you know, everyone's going to be tuned in. Like everyone was tuned in for the um, the moon, the moon landing. Yeah, and I don't sure. know, have you listened to the, that you, you should listen to it if you've not, but it's called 12 Minutes to the Moon or it might be 13 Minutes to the Moon, mm. but it's a podcast by the BBC. Mm. And the whole concept is what it's the whole process of going to the moon yeah. from start to finish. And then the they, they, they go into detail about the last 12 minutes before they landed because it was like so hectic. In the fact that they actually landed on the moon that day, alive, all of them, unreal. Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely magic. Like, and that what they had going on the ground was basically like a, like a net of humans making like a computer because the, the computers are so bad. So it's, mm. it was a bunch of humans speaking over on top of each other, essentially, yeah. all with like just listening for individual words. Like, I don't know what the words would be, but it's like this guy is looking for like, you know, Delta one five. If he hears that, he pushes this button yeah. and he's saying he's watching some other stuff. And it's just like it's just was like hundreds of people yeah. on the ground all talking over each other and they let you listen to it. Crazy. And it's just hectic, bewildering. You're just like, what is going on here? And yeah. the average age of people in that room was like 23. Yeah. Because they were like, okay, we need really smart people. Let's go to the universities. Yeah. So everybody was like That's crazy. 20 years old. Yeah. Or it was like maybe the average was like 26 or something like that. It was insanely low. Like yeah. there was very few people who had like actual experience. Yeah. It's just absolutely mental. So yeah, it's, you yeah. should listen to that. It's absolutely That's amazing. That's super cool. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff like that though that makes people be like, oh yeah, it's fake for sure. <laughs> just because like, I mean, yeah, it's a really crazy hard thing that happened, but it happened, right? Like yeah. in 1969, yeah. that long ago, if we managed to land on the moon, it was like, I don't know, pretty cool. Probably meant it was like it was meant to be if all that, everything worked out yeah. throughout all of Artemis or not Artemis. Um, Apollo? Yes, Apollo. Sorry, yeah. I'm getting my, my moon missions mixed up. Yeah, they, they even go into, oh, it's so mental that, that podcast because they go into detail about the, the failed, um, like it was a test it was a test under vacuum in the capsule yeah and they had the astronauts in there like the original astronauts that were supposed to go to the moon yeah and they were doing this test and i can't remember what the actual error was but in any case a fire started in the capsule yeah and the guys got melted alive because the door took three minutes to open yeah that's crazy like yeah I know like the astronauts that were going to go to the moon literally just got melted alive it's like that that's not a story that you hear about no well much. that's exactly why i'm like i wouldn't have never heard about that yeah they're, they're not going to be promoting that no that's, not at all yeah but like that was a huge it's funny because in the podcast they have all the people that were there because everyone was so young at the time yeah so they're talking to all these people and they were like you know what like it was a terrible thing but like they learned so many lessons yeah. as a result of that like and they they re-engineered the whole the whole yeah. lot and they think that if that didn't happen they would never have got the moon in the first place because they they checked everything for safety after that yeah i mean like it's an incredibly hard thing and it's unbelievable that they were able to do it and it takes a massive sacrifice to do what they did at that time it still takes a ma massive sacrifice like people are like oh yeah why don't like why did they just stop going to the moon why don't we just go to mars why don't we do all of this stuff and it's like because it takes thousands of people, billions of dollars, and a ton of time to leave this planet, which is a crazy thing to even consider, and then fly a really, really, really long way and land again and come back. Yeah, like <laughs> it's gonna be really hard and it's gonna like bad, nothing, there's gonna be bad things that happen. You can't just have it go perfectly. It's also like, like why? I guess the, the the issue with us not going is, well, why? Yeah. Whereas the reason before was like, there was kind of like this Cold War dynamic. Yeah, for sure. And it was a race, essentially. Good thing, yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, like it ended in this beautiful thing, but ultimately yeah. it was motivated by all these kind of like of course. geopolitical things. Yeah. So there's just kind of like, no one's racing to the moon. No. So it's like, what is the reason for us to do that? And well, yeah, they realized that it cost way too much <laughs> money. To probably to flex, basically. Yeah, exactly. Like they probably didn't need to go in 1969, right? Like they probably could have waited. It was a lot of money. They spent in a like, yeah, just ridiculous. Crazy. Insane. Yeah. Um, do you do you believe in aliens? 
I want them to be real. I want like <laughs> it doesn't everybody. Yeah, but like you hear like these are like the reasons why if we haven't seen them yet, they're probably not real, right? But it's like again, we're sitting here from our planet looking through telescopes at things far away. Like how much is there between us and that thing really far away that we don't understand yet that we can't through telescopes that isn't telling us what's that like what else is actually there like it just to me the science saying that there's a, there's a good possibility that they're not there is based on the very limited information that we have here so if there's as much universe as there they say there is as we think there is there's probably something in that whole thing that's gonna be like yes okay they exist that, yeah amen that's yeah yeah it's facts yeah. they have you uh, watched any of the Bob Lazar documentaries? Have you heard that name? Heard the name, yeah. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would go. <laughs> I would go and watch that. Oh man, yeah, it's a whole can of worms to open Is right it, there. Yeah. yeah, it's it's um, yeah. I, I just don't. I don't see any reason why for him to be lying. And basically, he claims to be. Uh, rocket scientist well he is a rocket scientist and was working on rockets from like seven years old yeah so what just kind of was this like propulsion genius yeah um in the <laughs> lucky guy <laughs> yeah like cool guy and um he was actually i don't know if you've seen that video the first like one of the first hydrogen cars mm. so like propulsion guy like he was like yeah. he had a hydrogen car before hydrogen cars were a thing and just made rockets out the back of his garden and stuff like that so eventually important people in the u.s government like are like oh cool this guy's really useful yeah and this is how the story goes they scoop him up and bring him into area 51 yeah to work on some special government operations yeah signs a bunch of waivers goes in there perfect guy for the job and his story as he tells it yeah. is that he worked on propulsion systems um not of this world that basically bent gravity around the the vehicle yeah to move forwards in any sort of direction as fast as it wants yeah um so yeah that's his that's his story the documentary is definitely the, my explanation is not gonna yeah not gonna do no, it and for sure. people just think you're insane for for talking about these sorts oh, of, of things know, but and, and obviously he's been like completely just destroyed destroyed yeah. yeah it's basically ruined his life coming out about the story but the reason that he did it is he thought he was in danger yeah um his wife was cheating on him yeah whilst he was there the government found out before he did and because she was cheating on him yeah they thought he was going to be unstable emotionally yeah so kicked him out but because they kicked him out hmm. he thought oh shit i'm in trouble here uh, yeah. they're gonna they're gonna cap me yeah. if i don't <laughs> if i don't come out about this and tell the world yeah i'm gonna be dead yeah so he came out and he told the story and basically Crazy. from there it's just like ruined his whole life and yeah. everything it's, like that but he sticks by it and it's the, the story's so like if he's, he's acting yeah. like he's the best actor no, in I'm the sure. world either way true or not he believes a hundred percent what he thinks like I'm sure there's no way in his mind that it's not that. Doesn't like, seem that way. Whether it is true or whether it's not true, I'm not going to be the one to judge that, right? Like, I'm sh like, when you hear stories like that and they're so detailed and they're so real and you see the people's passion for it, you're like, oh, it has to be real. But then you're like, can the government lie that much? Can they hide these secrets? Can Area 51 really be this alien, crazy gravity engine base kind of place right mm. and it's like it's always like no no but but maybe yeah, yeah like yeah. It's, there's always going to be a little bit and i mean there's obviously secrets in the world so maybe somebody knows something that we don't yeah i'm i love that sort of stuff i like considering the alternative alternative regard yeah. regardless of what it is yeah and uh you know into my older age i've sort of gotten a lot more mature with just adopting ideas without actually thinking them through. Yeah. Like you hear some crazy shit online now and you're just like, you want to believe it. Like it sounds logical, but you need to just dig in a little bit further. Yeah. I'm definitely one of these people that adopts ideas really quickly. Like yeah. if, if somebody says like, oh, they've got this idea, this is that idea. I'm like, yo, sick, that's perfect. Let's go, <laughs> let's try it, you know, let's, let's do it. Yeah. So I have to like approach all these things with a little bit of skepticism because I'm yeah. I'm quick to do it, but yeah, if people are watching and would like to go and uh, 
and explore it. Bob Lazar. Just type in Bob Lazar Era Fifty One into Netflix. It's I'm going to. Yeah. It's definitely a. It's definitely an interesting watch. Yeah, I mean, fuck. People are so quick to judge about all that stuff. Yeah. Anyways, it's like, I mean, have an opinion, sure, but keep your mouth shut until you you've seen and you've understood what like what these people are saying. Like, they maybe they're not right. Maybe after that you still think, oh, whatever. But I mean, just wait a little bit, understand what you're talking about before you're just gonna dismiss everything right away. Totally. Yeah. Uh, oh, have you watched Interstellar as well? Oh, I just watched that like not that long ago. Really? It's a really good movie. Dude, that shit made me cry. Like, <laughs> it's so gnarly. Like, just when he's like, the time's being lost on Earth. Yeah. And he's like, oh man. Yeah. That's the way the music, like the Hans Zimmer. Yeah. Oh, oh man. They're still like watching it. There's still a couple like technical things that I'm just like, Oh, you could have just asked somebody and you wouldn't have had to do that, right? They really, but like, really tried for but that. I know, though. but like 95% of it, I was like, wow, really? Like, just, I'm like surprised. Like, that's a lot of effort and a lot of work to get all these little details right. But obviously, they're going to be like, okay, but it's a movie and it's a really dramatic movie. There's, they're going to bend it just a little bit sometimes, which is fine, right? If they, they I wouldn't, a movie would be pretty boring if it was 100% as it is in real life like yeah what were the things that were kind of like just a little bit off i can't like off the top of my head i couldn't remember but i there was a couple stuff about i think like when they were launching from earth i think there was a couple stuff there and then it was just like it was mostly on the mechanical side of it like on the rocket engineering side that i was like okay that doesn't seem quite right and but it was good like where they took a lot of the creative liberties were in the areas where there is no understanding right yeah like right going into a black hole we think that you'd go in and you'd be spaghettified the technical term yeah, yeah and just turned into you'd be ripped into atoms right and then from that like can all the way down but in the movie it's like okay well nobody's nobody's fallen into one right so they're like okay maybe maybe you just get all warped and you go into this alien box thing where you can see the past i watched it differently the the second time I watched it like the first time around I thought it was a brilliant but the second time around I don't know it was just a few years later and I was like it's one of those movies that you can watch multiple times and get a different sort of meaning oh, from sure. it and yeah. I feel like they went the the from there that was when like the art started like obviously the whole movie is art but like yeah. they came up with a concept and that concept of them reaching through the spoiler alert just for, skip the next 10 <laughs> minutes if you've not watched Interstellar yeah. but when he reaches through the um like the bootcase that the the thing that that said to me was that like time hmm. is so precious for us because whatever that was in yeah. the black hole it wasn't like time is the thing that we have as humans yeah and the finite nature of time is is really is the best thing oh, like the fact sure. that we do die yeah is like the best thing because it gives so much like value to the to the moment of course, yeah. and that the, the him reaching through the bookshelf with it to his, to his daughter that he loves to yeah. me was like it meant it was showing the power of love yeah. over like space time like yeah. love is a force yeah, that course. can be yeah. that is like unexplainable and just kind of like so that's kind of what that was that was yeah, saying to me sure. and I was like this is way deeper than I thought <laughs> it was yeah you know it's a crazy movie that might be For one sure. of my favorite movies that's of all really time good yeah I mean I feel like we want so so badly to be able to just be like let's go back in time right because we value the experiences and the mistakes we made in the past it, like that that's what determines your whole life everything that's happened in the past that's gonna change your future so we want so badly for it to be true that we can just do something to hop back into time but there's no evidence that that's that <laughs> It's just a doubt. It might not be something that we can experience as the three dimensional people that we are in the universe we live in. Maybe nowhere ever, but like we all want it so badly and it's probably never going to happen. <laughs> what about uploading your consciousness into somewhere else? I just, I don't, you're not going to go backwards. You're going to just go sideways and then forwards mm. again. 
I don't like. Yeah, you won't. You won't go backwards. But if we if we could have gone backwards, we would have gone backwards, right? We would have. There would be evidence of people going backwards in time, right? Like Stephen Hawking's party for time travelers or whatever it was, where he held the party, didn't tell anybody about uh, anybody about it, but it was a party to host time travelers, right? So only people in the future would know about it, and they'd come back. Nobody came. Like it's a, the sad truth is probably not a thing, or I don't. I don't think that's. I think that's just one of the forces that we we don't get it. We touch. don't get a say in. No, it's just yeah. it's a it just moves that way. Humans like to they, they like to have a say. Yeah, exactly. They really they really grab this really grabbing this globe right now. They're really yeah. strangling it. Yeah. Well, like like in like time dilation, right? And like you're at the edge of a black hole. Your time's moving at a completely different rate of the other person. But you're you can only get like infinitely close to the line you can never go below it like mm. you can spend millions of years in 10 minutes right theoretically but you can't go the other but way you can't you're never gonna go back yeah that's mad isn't it yeah time behaving like that is just crazy like the the there's a calculation that was done on like if you were to just like fly around the earth a few times and how much like there'd yeah. be a difference yeah. and how you experience time but it'd be minute mind you you would never notice it but but it's still there it's yeah. always gonna be yeah. and like taller people are experiencing time yeah, differently yeah, you know they're further I mean? away, yeah it's crazy yeah it's bizarre well sweet i mean i'm kind of out of topics but yeah fair enough it's all good do you guess we'll kind of like end with like what we can expect from bodhi in the future um tough to say I I have a lot of goals and I'm going to work as hard as I can to achieve those goals. You know, I want to win World Cups. I want to be world champion one day. But, you know, take it step by step and just ride at the absolute best I can in the safest way possible for as long as I want or as long as I can. You do seem madly mature. It's actually crazy. Like, how old are you now? 17. You're 17. 18 of May. Yeah. yeah. So you just got a driver's license like... Not too long ago. Yeah, like a couple of months ago. Yeah, you're Two talking months. like you're way older. <laughs> but it's so funny, like the, the crew or the six, it's always like like pick on the junior yeah. sort of sort of vibe going on. It's quite funny. I know. And well and like you know, act a little differently around, you know, the boys kind of thing. You know, you have a good time, you shoot the shit, but you know, you sit down and have a conversation. It's you know, less of a like, ah oh, yeah, fucking junior kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good crew here. You're in great hands. It's oh yeah, it's sick. I know. We're gonna we're gonna do this all year. So hell yeah, we're gonna make some banging. We're content. gonna be banging. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Cheers. I didn't. That's good. Yeah, Thumbnail? that's that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs>